Hi, I'm uh, Peter Harrop, Chairman of ID TechX, and we're here at a regular exhibitor in the uh, busy ID TechX show here in Berlin. It is the Bot Factory, and uh, Jeff Brandon's going to tell us about it. Over to you. What on earth are you up to? What on earth are we up to? <laughs> um, yes, no, we're Bot Factory. We're from New York City, and uh, we have developed uh, a PCB printing technology. Um, our machine is capable of uh, not only printing conductive and insulating layers to make a multi-layer circuit, but we can also do dispensing and full assembly of boards on flexible or rigid substrates. Now here's an example of a, of a two-layer board here. This guy is a uh, actual 3D printed Arduino uh, with QFP, uh, SOIC, and edge connectors. Uh, two layers, 10 mil or 250 micron traces with 250 micron uh, spaces. We can go all the way down to 200, uh, 200 microns there. Here's a flex board. Uh, it's another Arduino design, single layer. And uh, the essential idea is that anyone can fabricate an electronic device right at their desktop. It's perfect for researchers, people in education, people who are developing products, and essentially anyone who would come to one of wonderful shows like ID Tech X. Oh, it's very kind of you to say that. In <laughs> fact, in the domestic environment now, I don't think my son is alone in having 3D printers at home, and he won't even go to the ironmongers to buy a uh, a, a, a funnel to pour liquid into something, he prints it. I mean, the knee-jerk reaction is anything missing part of the bike, he prints it. Uh -huh. Do you think that there's a, a place in the home environment for this where one people would put together electronics or not? Uh, I think it's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, just because you have a paper printer doesn't make you Hemingway or, or Shakespeare. No. Uh, I think that the importance of, of a good design comes from iteration and development. So I think it improves the ability for anywhere from a younger child to, let's say, someone uh, who's more of a hobbyist to develop their own ideas. So it increases the capability of the home inventor uh, and someone who's a tinker or a thinker or wants to learn something more. But as a replacement for your ironmonger or your, your sort of oh, no, classic no. situation, no, your, your Curry's PC, I don't think so. No, okay, <laughs> that's good. So. Uh, you actually sell these things? Yes. So, and who do you, to whom do you sell them? I, well, mainly I, what type of person and where? Well, I like to be, I like to say that we're, you know, we're not digging the gold out of the mines. We're selling the shovels to the miners. So we sell the people who are developing circuit boards, people who are developing uh, new ideas and allowing them to make their board right there and then in an hour or two. Because Getting a board made takes several weeks. You have to send it off to China or some other uh, fabrication place. They pull it all up. And furthermore, to make flexible electronics is quite difficult and expensive too. So, and there's always a lot of iterative aspects. So people are working in flexible electronics, so the wearables, the medical devices, uh, companies are doing fashion, uh, researchers on stretchable electronics. Yes, fashion now. Uh, is, they're capable of essentially doing the things right there and then to iterate and yes. improve. So anyone who's developing new ideas or electronic yeah. devices where iteration is a critical yeah. part of the yeah. process because it's a new technology or a new idea, it's, that's where this machine really flies. And how big are you as a company? How many uh, of you? We're hiring right now. We're going up to 15 people. Good, great. And you are um, living a dream? I mean, five years from now, are you allowed, willing to tell us if all goes well? Uh -huh. um, where are you going to be in terms of uh, what you're offering and uh, where and why and oh, I think anything I th you can share? Uh, I mean, right now we're just improving that Z-dimension aspect to make every single layer print correctly so that you get a board that's 100% working right off the bat. Yep. Uh, critical uh, challenges we're addressing are things like you know making sure all the components correct, correct, uh, connect correctly on flexible and rigid materials. Um, we want to expand the size of the machine. We want to expand the possible materials that we can print with. Um, but right now we're focusing on fabricating what you see is what you get. You, know, you have a board designed, you send it to your machine, you press print, reliably prints everything. It works right off the bat. That's our focus. Five years from now, more materials and, and bigger size, that's a possibility, but it, that's a material question that is uh, a lot of the reasons why we're here. There's a lot of people developing new materials, and it's really oh, exciting. Absolutely. It's Huge really number. exciting yeah, to yeah. see what, what people are developing yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. That, that's the kind of fuel that drives you know, yeah. this product to go further and farther in terms of addressing market needs.
Excellent. That's really interesting. Roughly how much does your equipment sell for? Okay. Well, we have one product. Uh, well, this is our SV2. This is our new machine, and it goes for uh, 16,000 US dollars, uh, and we're exporting it around the world. Uh, out of our space in New York City. Uh, we also have our earlier product, Squink, which is still for sale for $5,000. Mm. Uh, the major differences are just really hardware, like one, they both they can both print and assemble boards, but really our differences in terms of tolerance and, and board quality, and number of layers, and so forth like that. Is there any increase in virtuosity that you could have in terms of what you can um, support in electronics because obviously electronics develops into all manner of different overlayers and mm -hmm. flip chips and many other things. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a route map there, you know, where you're saying, well, this or that I can't do at the moment? But <laughs> Well, I think we want to focus on the, uh, I mean, the, the most ideal rapid prototyping technology is essentially near equivalent to manufacturing quality, but it's done in an hour. Cost be damned. It's just done yeah, really, yeah, really yeah, fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, flip chip and things like that are great for large scale high quality yeah. quantity fabrication. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessary uh, for us to really focus on making sure our machines can uh, compatible with those types of chips. No, you can't chase everything, I realize. But I mean, yeah. if someone was to say a fashion designer and they, they probably want something fairly wide area and very low profile, uh -huh. and they want, therefore, from you something compatible with that. Uh -huh. um, but um, it's easy to talk about what, what comes next. And you obviously have here something that can sell um, considerably as it is. I, I'm yeah. not really being critical. It's just exploring the edges of the canvas, as mm. they say. So good. OK. Thanks very much. Yeah. Really exciting. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for uh, coming again. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. See you. All Thank right. You. Bye yes. for now. Bye bye. Can you show it just a little bit more about this? Sure, sure. So what's happening right now? Believe it or not, this is the actual print board. We're printing the design of the print board that actually runs on this uh, machine. Uh, it's an example, actually. So it's kind of like it's a mirror image of what it's of its own design. And this is the new machine? Yeah, this is our new SV2 PCB printer. SV2, so how many uh, generations have you had so far? Uh, we are on generation, this is number two. This is uh, this is the second version of second. our Second. This is our second product. But you have a, a smaller one yeah, too? Yeah, it's called Squink. Squink. And so this is kind of Squink version two, SV2. That's kind of the idea. The Squink was the one the and Our two. first product, and this is the second one. And uh, so the one we did last time was Squink one. Yeah. And so what's the main so, improvement? Uh, the main improvement has, first, let's talk about printing. So, we're printing with 300 nozzles, not 12. So we have a wider print head. So it's half an inch, uh, 16 millimeters. Um, and then the second one, 14 millimeters. But anyways, uh, we're printing over a larger area, oh, so we can print much faster. The nozzles are smaller, so we can print finer traces. So that's one capability. Um, that allows us to do more layers, because we're printing faster. Uh, the second capability is the dispensing system. Uh, much more complex uh, system with motors um, with a, well, you can't see quite here, but there's a cartridge you pull out with a syringe uh, and a motor system on the inside to dispense. And so we can dispense smaller dots, uh, wider range of materials because it's a stronger motor and so forth. What's the material it's printing right now? Uh, it's printing a polymer. Uh, that's UV curable. There's UV lamps on the head that cure the material very quickly. And it does open air, what's called, just does it in any temperature? Well, I mean, ambient room temperature. Yeah. Ambient, you know, humidity. Yeah. Um, is this your software? Yeah, so this is our software, and just like with Squink, it's a browser based system. You don't connect to the internet per se. You basically, what, what happens is you connect to the machine by, by Ethernet. So don't worry. Your IP is safe. It's only going between the machine. We only make it browser-based and have a server on the back so that we can update the software uh, much more easily. Uh, and this also makes the, the machine software hardware agnostic. It doesn't matter if you're PC, Mac, Linux, whatever. You'll be able to fabricate and connect to the machine and fabricate. And uh, is, is shipping? Uh, yep. So we ship around the world. We've been shipping uh, the past year or so. One more thing about pick and place. So we, we can pick and place as well. So this is the pick and place head. This is really valuable for a lot of customers because not only you can pick and place an assembled board 
that we made here, but you can also assemble your own boards that you've bought from elsewhere. So, uh, like before, you swap out the head and then you place it in here. Uh, there are tip holders over here where you can pick up tips and then pull the components from this components tray or from uh, cut tape right here. I'll use the camera like usual for producer recognition to make sure the components are, are correctly rotated in place. Now, one really interesting feature you can do now is let's say this is your board that you bought and you wanted to assemble using RSV2. You can place it pretty much anywhere on the, on the substrate in any direction using the dispensing head or the pick and place head. You just have to identify a few pads and then the machine will autocorrect and dispense correctly across the board. Is the camera? No, it's actually just, you simply have to hover over several different pads to make sure the alignment, it's aligned correctly to the board. It knows where it has to go to and it will dispense the board. So it takes out a little bit of the careful placement of the board so it's you know 90 degrees to the head and all that jazz. You don't have to worry about that with this machine. So you said there was a squink? And yep. this one now, so what have people done so far, your customers? Uh, we have customers who are working in flexible electronics. Uh, we have a lot of customers making rapid prototyping boards. They want the boards there and then that day, they use our machines for that. Uh, and then they can take that and, and put it into like a SMT later? Or not uh, really? Like can they prototype something and then say, hey, we, do, we need to tweak it for the mass production? Uh-huh, yeah. So I mean, typically if you, the goal is with our product is that you make the board, you fabricate it a few times and then you're happy with it, you essentially send it out to make thousands of those boards. Um, there may be tweaks required. Hey, if you want to make it smaller, you may have to fabricate it, design it for manufacturing. Just like with 3D printing, where you print a design, you discover, oh, I need to add draft angles so I can injection mold the piece. Um, but typically, there's minimum need changes need to be made if you want to make something with our machine and then send it out later on. The, the PCB designers, they use, uh, what is the name of those softwares that many of them use, right? The EDA, Electronic Design Applications. So EDA in industry, but they use a software, uh, there's some popular ones that they might use, yeah, right? So but is that a compatible format? Whatever yep. you do here is compatible with that? Yeah, so it doesn't matter if you're using Eagle, Altium, Cadence, what have you. You export the files as Gerber files with drill files and your centroid and rotation file, which is just a .csv, .excel document with headers. Uh, and that information is sort of an industry standard if you send boards out. So What's we take those imports and you can, you can, uh, you can print with them. Is it, is However, it done? you can also uh, use uh, image files. So I've printed silver images, uh, like images, PNGs, JPEGs, bitmaps, TIFFs, and essentially you can upload them to the machine and we'll print them. Um, and what's the resolution? Is it... Uh... We're going all the way down to detail of trace width of 200 microns and with spaces of 200 microns. That's, That's small. equivalent to 8 and 8 mil. Is that small for the PCB market? That's incredibly small. Uh, now, it's not as small as your high definition interconnects, which often go to as low as 3. Uh, but it's acceptable for most applications, most components. Typically, the components are the driving force for trace width. And when you have a, a PCB output it like this, something like this, mm -hmm. is it super reliable? You can put it in like a car and it's just going to work? Or what, how, what's the reliability of the end PCB? Well, prototyping is kind of one of those things you don't want to necessarily put it in a consumer product. Um, you may want to ask BMW, but a, would you be comfortable a flying? A prototype BMW. But a prototype? Sure. If it's not going to be on public road, being used by the public, I don't see why there's a problem with using it. It's just silver on plastic in the end. It conducts. Um, now is it going to run under every single sort of possible situation a consumer might go through? No. But for general prototyping where you need to have it now to test something out or something non, um, let's say what's worth for it, uh, non-mission critical like lighting, this is a perfect product for that. And we actually see a lot of people in the automotive industry and other critical areas like aerospace, they want this, you know, flexible electronics for lighting and things like that. Stuff so where they just need to make something very fast but there's a lot of iteration for whatever reason, lighting or shape or or you know, trying to address failure points in the, in the flexible circuit, that kind of thing. Are there uh, lots of, uh, what you call those maker spaces and stuff like that, they have this? Yeah, there's some maker spaces. Typically makers are trying to go as low cost as possible and we're trying to hit the prosumer, product development, high-end research, that kind of market because they need the kind of specs that we can provide. 
Nice. So I guess the hardware designers at Google, they can have fun with this. I'm oh, yeah. Talking. Absolutely. Making some Google, if you can hear me. stuff, future stuff. Cool. All right. Looking forward to, to more. Yeah, man. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.